Proudly brought to you by your mobile team. And Holden, Australia's driving future. This motorsport feature is proudly brought to you by your mobile team. And Holden, Australia's driving future. can boast numerous postcard settings for its major racing circuits, but none more impressive than Belgium's Spa-Francorchamps course. Located 120 kilometres southeast of Brussels in the Ardennes Forest, Spa is the traditional home of the Belgian Formula One Grand Prix and touring car racing's most arduous contest, the 24-hour day-night enduro. The circuit once measured over 14 kilometres, but was changed back in 83 to this shortened layout of 6.94 k's, which still combines the high-speed straights, sweeping turns and hairpin corners, qualifying as one of the world's most challenging circuits. The 24 hours of Spa is the manufacturer's blue ribbon race. It's also round eight of the European Touring Car Championship, a title which began back at Monza, Italy in March and marked the arrival in Europe of the Australian Commodore. Local stars Peter Brock, Alan Moffat, Alan Grice and Graham Bailey were the flavours of the month. Grice led the opener before encountering problems and at chequered flag time the old firm of Tom Walkingshaw and Wynne Percy were in victory lane. Round two was in the snow and sleet at Donington Park, England. The Commodores were back, Grice in his underfunded white V8 and Brock in the mobile Holden dealer team entry. Both led the event before trouble set in. Yet again, the Rovers' drovers, Walkingshaw and Percy, showed the field no mercy. Round three was at Hockenheim, Germany, where the Volvos were keen to stage a fight back. So too was Alan Grice, who charged to the front and resisted every passing attempt until taken out of the field of play by an errant golf. The Volvos, however, hung in there to score their first blue chip points in the series. Round four took the teams back to Italy in Masano, where Formula One ace Gerhard Berger gave BMW its first major win of the tournament. The closest finish of the championship came in round five at Andersdorf in Sweden. Lindstrom and Granberg appeared to have it all sewn up, but Armin Hanna and the Bastos Rover came from the clouds to push the Volvos all the way to the flag. Round six was behind the Iron Curtain at Bruno in Czechoslovakia, where the Ford Sierra set the early pace. At the finish, though, it was Lindstrom first again for Volvo. The seventh race of the series was at Zeltwig in Austria. The Volvos and Rovers topped the qualifying and dictated the early pace. But Siggy Muller and the Ford Sierra Turbo tasted victory after the Swedemobile produced a hiccup at post-race scrutineering. The eighth round was at the Nürburgring in Germany, and Roberto Revalia sprung another BMW surprise. After eight rounds, the score sheet shows three wins to Volvo, two by Rover and BMW, and a single victory to Ford's Turbo Sierra. Well, hello and welcome to the Spa-Francorchamps course here in Belgium. The scene for the 24-hour Enduro for touring cars, and what a race it promises to be. This year's event holds special significance because of the participation by a record number of Australians. Peter Brock's two-car mobile Commodore team is here. Alan Grice is back in the Roadways Commodore. And, of course, Denny Holm and Ron Dixon renew their association with the Tom Walkingshaw team. The Australians couldn't have picked a tougher race. It's a little different to a 100k round of the Australian Touring Car Championship. 24 hours. It'll be tough, but they're all glad to be here. Well, preparation is everything, Mike, and uh, 24 hours, if, if you can just keep those little things from going wrong. And with our Calder test a, a month ago, the preparation that's taken place in Germany, plus our confidence in the product, we have to bring our mobile Holden Deer team home. New Zealand and Australia, I think, went to genuine European Group A regulations, and it's enabled us to be compare ourselves and have a yardstick 
to what goes on in Europe and uh, I think we do rather well in Australia and New Zealand and we can come over there and hold our own as well. Probably one of the premier events in the world. Position 23. Down away from Rivage and through Tour. Walkinshaw leads with Harmer in the second Bastos Rover there in second place. Pirro in third. And Alan Grice now looks to have moved up the field to fourth place. Yes, indeed. A great start from Alan Grice. Doing very, very well indeed. There's Granberg in car number two. Sitting right in behind him. Giudone in the Ford Turbo Sierra. And also Soper making a good move here on the inside. Just look at the traffic congestion. But the Rovers at this stage are running away from it. There's Grice up to fourth. Then car number four coming through very quickly, that's Giudone. And his teammate, of course, is uh, Britain, Steve Soper. Ran through Stavlo and now up towards Blanchimor, where they rejoin now the old circuit, the old spa circuit, which used to be 14 kilometres long and was a flat-out blind. They shoot along the long straight now, all the way up to what is affectionately known as the bus stop chicane. Walking shorts in front, Harner in second place, Carroll in third, and there in fourth place is Alan Grice. Here's the two Rovers, and Grice making a move here on Pirro. Tom Walkingshaw through this part of the course, sitting right in behind Armin Hanna. Next is Pirro in the BMW, Alan Grice the next one, followed by Giudone, and then Granberg moving up very quickly indeed, and Peter Brock in car number five. Up towards La Source, the hairpin here, just before the pit straight, to complete the first of many laps, 24 hours here at Spa. Exit this corner, and Alan Grice sitting right on the tail here of Pirro. Here's Grice. We'll see if he makes his move. Trying to find some racing room. Moves to the outside of Pirro now. And the Sydney Privateer as they stream down the front straight. Has he got him? Yes, he has. Grice now moves into third spot. Walking shore leading. Harner in second. Here comes Grice, and Pirro right behind him. Watch out for the Fords as well. The Ford Sierras now of Budone and so for the two works cars. And the non-works car there of Harold Gross also moving up. The Ford Sierras with the turbo power beginning to show here on the high-speed straights of Spa. Once again, they stream along the straight. Tom Walkingshaw in command of the situation, the fastest man here. There's Alan Grice running in third spot at the moment. BMW losing a spot as well, and Peter Brock making a good move up here on the inside and car number five, so he's making very steady progress. Yes, Brock up past Harold Gross there with that one of those Ford Sierras as the cars come down. Now through the corner of Rivage, a tight right-hand hairpin, and accelerate away, down through Pouar, and up towards Stavlo. Tom Walkingshaw, who has put a lot of effort and certainly a lot of sponsorship money into the exercise here this weekend. Once again, we take uh, pictures from Wolf Granberg's car as he sits in behind the BMW, heading down the hill to the right-hander. Granberg on the brakes there, and as he accelerates out of here, the car switching slightly sideways there, the car in front of him that you can see is the BMW of Pirro. Here's Giudone making a move on Alan Grice. So Grice finds himself under a little bit of pressure here. Giudone in car number four. The two Rovers streaming away and Giudone has actually passed Grice. Now Pirro moving up to put a little pressure on the Sydney Privateer through a Rouge once again. There's Grice. Pirro going through. Giudone. Then Peter Brock moving up a spot. Yes, the Sierra is moving right up now as walking short comes up towards Lake Home for what is now the third time. 24 hours still to go. The race starts a little bit late. It's now exactly 5 o'clock. Watch out behind her now. Pirro coming up alongside of Dan Murray. Here comes Croft in the 05 Global Commodore. Looking for a way past, but there's no way you can try that straight on Granberg. And Brock off the bends in the art ends. He joins the track and continues having lost two places. In these days of modern technology with motorsport, you would think the two-way radios would be essential here for the Spa 24-hour race. Essential they might be, but bam, they certainly are. So the Peter Brock team have gone, of course, to this to assist the pit crews. Peter is coming in. He'll dip the right blinker the lap before. If tyres are required, it's the left blinker. If he has a problem with brakes, of course, it's down to the flash, the lights, the lap before. Then, of course, the gap forward, the gap to the back. If you're going well, OK, Bonza, it's thumbs up. And hopefully it'll be that way at the end of 24 hours. So a little improvisation from the Peter Brock Mobile Holden dealer team. Hopefully at the end of 24 hours, it'll all pay off for them. Thanks, Mike. Well, one man with problems before even an hour out of that 24 is up there is Remion's Toyota, car number 113. He's been off the circuit. There's rumours of some oil on the circuit. He's coming to have the bodywork pulled off the front of the car. 
and we look down here, the car being repaired, they're doing their best to do it, but Mike, there is oil on the circuit. There certainly is, and a lot of it. Here's Tom Walkinshaw coming through, Alan Harner sitting right in behind him, but down at the next turn, they're waving the oil flags, and Harner, very much sideways, Marshall standing on the edge of the track, waving the cars down at 180 k's. Goodness gracious me. Walkingshaw still continues to lead from Armin Hanna. Then Alan Grice has been slipping back through the field in fifth spot at the moment. Dieter Cuesta right behind him as they come through Eau Rouge. And Peter Brock, if anything, is gaining on them. And so too is Aussie Ron Dixon. Yeah, Dixon's Rover now starting to catch up to show the pace of the other two Rovers up ahead there. Carter has dropped back a little bit as a result of that sideways moment earlier on and perhaps taking a while to settle himself. He almost got sideways again there on the oil as he goes away, and now look at this. Here, Brock is now right up with Grice. They've got a slow Mercedes ahead of them. Grice looks towards the inside there. And Cuesta keeping them all honest as well as they exit that corner. Here's Grice, number 27, running in fifth spot. Brocky is right behind him in the number five car as they head down through the chicane. So Brock's doing it well, and Dixon is there, but Grice is slowing. He's got a problem there, Mike. He's got a problem, and I'm not sure what it is. He's driving there by the side of the track. Well, there's something has gone wrong with Grice. Oh, Grice off the racetrack in the dirt and the dust, and it would appear he's dropped the front wheel off the car. So bad luck indeed for Alan Grice and the Roadways Commodore. Yes, the front wheel is completely missing. Obviously, he's trying to use the outside rim around the circuit to get back to the pit area, but it's a long haul back to the pits. Yes, indeed, but he's trying there to stop any more damage to the car, and Brock's into the pits as well. It's a bit early for a routine stop at this stage. Well, mechanics are unsure about this. They're ready to change the tyres. What's this? Peter Brock stepping from the car. The hood is up. And the early indications are there is a motor problem with the number five car. Bad luck indeed with Bryce coming off. And then, of course, uh, Peter Brock. And here's Bryce arriving right behind Brock. Front wheel missing. Bryce out of the car talking to co-driver Michelle Delcourt. So the Aussies have got a lot of work to do in the pit area. Yes, they're looking underneath the car. I wonder that, whether despite Grice's efforts to keep the car on the smooth there on the, on the side of the track, whether or not that's damaged the underneath of the car. And we notice also that Armin Hanna has gone through and taken the boss from walking So Hanna is looking pretty good at this stage in car number seven, the Bastos Rover. The Rovers are in front and looking good in the start 24 hours. Well, the Alan Grice, number 27 Commodore, being pushed back in the pit bay. They still have a lot of work to do on the car. And meantime, problems for Peter Brock's number five car, we believe, has blown a head gasket, so they have a lot of work to do. Meantime, the number six car is in their second entry with the Kiwis aboard. Graham Bowquet goes out and returns to the racetrack. And looks like a problem here for one of the Ford Sierras. Yes, Mike, it's blown a turbocharger, and they're pushing that car away, and I think they're going to retire that one. At this stage in the race, there's no way that you can spend that much time repairing the car. And in comes number seven, the lead car now. Hana gets out. Jeff Allen takes over. This is a routine pit stop, and out goes Alan back into the race. Whether or not he can hold that lead over Walkinshaw, who's already made his pit stop, remains to be seen. There's Berger waiting for the BMW to come in. Gerhard Berger, a man in a hurry, and the Volvo in for a routine pit stop. And it's Olofsson, who's been running very, very strongly indeed. Mechanic very quickly on, changing wheels. Mauro Baldi steps into the car. Olofsson... Uh, Filling him in with any problems the car might have. It doesn't appear to have any. It's been running very, very strongly indeed. The Nordica Volvo returns to the track. Meantime, number seven, Jeff Allen. At the
controls, making up for lost time, trying to keep the lead. But unfortunately, Tom Walkinshaw, we believe, uh, has been able to do that rather effectively. Number 10 car going through, Hero. Yes, Berger's still waiting in the pits to take that car over. There's the 29 Kenwood BMW of Fabian Giro going through. Once again, we pick them up on the front straight. And one driver who is making a great fist of the Spa 24-hour classic is this man, Ronnie Dixon of Australia in car number nine, up in the top eight and running very, very strongly indeed. And talking about Aussies, here's number 105, Sydney privateer Bob Holden in the small car class and hanging in there all the way. Down towards our roots, down the start, finish straight there. You can see the, the Sierra there. Needs it now at the wheel of Sofa's car. That's the three car. And there's the number two Volvo. There's Needsbits again, running well with the Sierra. It'll be interesting to see whether or not this car can finish 24 hours. It's the first 24-hour race these have ever done. Whoops. And That looks like uh, Graham Bouquet has gone off the circuit in car number six, just tried to shorten the corner a little, but he manages to go through the chicane without dropping a spot. Whoops! 111 around sideways, and plenty of traffic coming from behind. And it's the miss, I know not how. Alan Moffat sitting in the number five car they've effected repairs to that and the car is ready to take back to the racetrack drops an hour and a half they've got a lot of work to do to be able to pick that up meantime number seven driven by jeff allen beautifully through that turn and sweeping away down to the next left hander yes away goes alan there and in the pits now that's the uh, 06 car isn't it that's that mobile holden dealer team number six car and out goes grice Grice now back in the race as well as the sign for Jeff Allen to come in and Denny Holm to take over that rover. That's the seven car. In it comes. Certainly a lot of work in the pit area, as you mentioned. The Grice car has gone out to Michelle Del Court at the wheel of that car. A routine stop here for the rovers. Jeff Allen is out. Denny Holm now in behind the wheel. So New Zealand's former Grand Prix champion takes on the Spa 24-hour classic. There's Walkingshaw back out in front now. The car at the moment driven by Eddie Hewson, but the Walkingshaw 8 Bastos Rover is back out in the lead. Once again, coming down towards the right-hander, number five, Alan Moffat at the wheel of the Peter Brock Commodore. Got a lot of work to do, and as you can see, the lights are on at Spa. Yes, this is the most difficult time here. Dusk and dawn. Drivers are not quite sure whether or not to switch the lights on. The definition goes. They can't quite see what's going on ahead of them. And the traffic is always a problem in a 24-hour race with some 20 seconds difference between some of the cars in lap times. There goes Moffat in the 05 car. Yes, Moffat uh, coming back up through the field again. The hour and a half that they dropped will certainly put them out of winning contention, for outright anyway. There's number six. That's the second of the mobile Commodores. That's running very strongly. Within the top 12 in the field as Gerhard Berger sweeps down into Eau Rouge again. So Berger looking pretty strong in the top four. Number eight. Eddie Houston steps out of the Tom Walkingshaw Rover, lets the boss loose. Goodness me, hasn't he stamped his seal on this 24-hour uh, race so far? Their cars have been running strongly. The only disappointment is that the Ron Dixon, the third Bastos Rover, is out of the race with uh, a fuel pump failure. Meantime, pit signals out to the mobile Holden dealer team. John Harvey in car number five has stepped out of the car looking for a co-driver. But there's no Peter Brock about. Brock was scheduled to do this stint and Harvey is anything but happy. Says, oh, to hell with it. I'll go out and drive the next stint myself. Obviously, Harvey might have come in just a little earlier. Yep, Harvey's trapped himself back in there. He's getting out again now. Brock's arrived. Brock now gets into the car, and it's bad enough to have lost the hour and a half that they lost earlier on. Maybe they, perhaps they don't feel that uh, they're back in contention anymore. And in a 24-hour race, anything can happen. They start the car there for Brock, and out he goes, back into the race with the 05 Mobile Dealer Team car. One of the most important facets of the Spa 24-hour classic is, of course, the night driving stint. And that brings, again, a whole new set of circumstances where drivers are a little tired, pit crews are starting to feel the pinch, particularly if they've been changing engines. And a fellow who's been through that experience is John Harvey, who's just returned to the pit. What was it like? And it looks like it's still very hectic. Yeah, the pace is very hot out there. Uh, although driving at night is not quite so bad. Uh, 
got to admit, I didn't even use the spotlights on the car. He used the normal Commodore headlights. And they, the uh, drivers are very courteous. Uh, they wave you by, and when you go by, if they're on high beam with their spotlights on, they dim them, which is quite good. A bit of a worry when uh, cars come up behind you to pass, you say the uh, Volvos or the Rovers have got all their lights on, so I just turned the rear vision mirrors up, so um, that didn't annoy me, and I just wait until I see the lights uh, shining on the road right beside me. I know they're there, so I just wave them by. You were a little like a friend without a partner when you came in. It looked like you had to go out again, and then Rocky strode me. Was he having um, an R&R? &R? Well, they told Peter there was four laps before him. On that same lap, they asked me the question about fuel. I said, OK, and then the car ran out. So I switched to the reserve, which gives me a lap to get back. So I come back on that lap. And I think I caught them a little by surprise. Well, John Harvey, of course, a driver that we've been following along with Peter Brock and the Australians in the Spa 24 hours. If this was at home, the James Hardy would be finished. For the drivers here, there's three more. Dawn is just breaking here at Spa Francorchamps course as the 24 hour race continues. It's been quite arduous for the drivers and one red jacket at Channel 7 commentator, let me tell you. How a race can change during the night. At the early part of the evening, we had, of course, Armin Hanna leading in the Bastos Rover. Then, of course, the Formula One driver, Gerhard Berger, took over. But as dawn breaks, it's the old master, Tom Walkingshaw, in the Bastos Rover, who continues to lead this event. Second place has been held out by Gerhard Berger in a BMW. And third place, Armin Hanna in the second of the Bastos Rovers. Here we are at Eau Rouge. Walkingshaw comes through, twice winner of the event. Now on the far side of the circuit, going through Blanchimont. The first three cars still on the same lap now, after some 12 hours of racing. Coming down the straight again, and Tom Walkingshaw doing it very, very comfortably indeed in car number eight. Goodness me, as I said before, he's put his stamp on this race. The cars have run faultlessly. Siggy Muller now steps into the Eggenberger Ford Sierra, number three. The car has been running splendidly throughout the evening and he's still in there with a big chance. Down a couple of laps on the leaders, but, and a little slow to get up the hill for the first time. But Siggy Muller is underway. And here's the man they're all talking about in Europe this season, driving car number 10, Gerhard Berger, the Formula One driver, a winner of this event last year, and boy, what a splendid season he's having, not only in Formula One, but also in the touring cars. A man in a hurry, and electrifying to watch here at the spa Francorchamps course. Number seven there, that's the Hana Bastos Rover, Still running strongly there in third place. And it's a bit of a surprise, really. Last year, all three Rovers broke down. This year, two of them are still running strongly. The only one not in was Dixon's, and that dropped out with that fuel problem. Of course, one man that's uh, done extremely well in the Spa 24-hour classics is Dieter Cuesta driving the Schnitzer number 11 car. Very, very fast indeed during the evening segment of the race and still running very, very strongly here at the moment. Up in about fifth spot at the moment, Dieter Cuesta number 11, one to watch in this race. Yeah, should any of the quicker men up ahead of him who've been flying throughout the night hit problems, Cuesta could well be there. Who goes the two Volvo there, Granberg at the wheel, and that's another car that could well be there at the finish. He's run smoothly, strongly throughout the night, and he's running in around sixth place at the moment. Actually, both Volvos are running uh, strongly, as you say, Richard. Running almost in tandem on the course. Coming through the bend, car number two, Paul Granberg. Down to the next left-hander. And we take pictures from Granberg's car, all up there on the ripple strip, as they head down the long straight. Yes, as he's coming up towards bus stop chicane. He's now in fifth gear, absolutely flat out. The cars will peak somewhere between 150 and 160 miles an hour. And into the pits now comes one of the Volvos. This is the number one car. Mauro Baldi at the wheel, Johnny Chicotta to take over. Up go the jacks, up goes the bonnet. Chicotto getting into the car now. It's a routine stop. Baldi there, a man with a lot of experience with Lancias in world sports car racing. Strapping in Chicotto, himself an ex-Grand Prix driver. A change of brake pads as well at this stage. Well, the Nordica team certainly going about their work without uh, too much fuss. Very laid back. There's Johnny Chicotto at the wheel. He's ready to go out. So both Volvos are still in the race at this stage, and Volvo 
number one, driven by Johnny Chicotto, rejoins the Spa 24-hour race. And we've got some problems here, some major problems. For, of course, the number five mobile Commodore. And would you believe it, it has blown a head gasket again. So that's two head gaskets. They're going to drop almost three hours in this race. They dropped an hour and a half on the first pit stop. And they've been in the pits now. Meantime, Peter Brock, with his chiropractor, Dr. Eric, having a little relaxing time there. And uh, it would appear at this stage that uh, Peter Brock, uh, after doing some night driving, is having a little relax. And Dr. Eric, obviously going to put him on a staple diet. The Brocky seems to be enjoying it. It's all a bit laid back. Michelle Delcourt now and the Alan Grice Roadways Commodore comes into the pit area. They've had a few problems during the night. The car had a minor off. It, of course, went off the circuit earlier with uh, a wheel dropping off the car. Just look at the size of Michelle Delcourt compared to Alan Grice. And uh, coming in now, Neil Lowe in the number six mobile Commodore for its regular pit stop. Neil about ready to step out. The car is off the jack. A case of who's the lair with the air. But uh, finally, he gets out of the car. It could be more dangerous getting out of the mobile Commodore than it can driving it during the 24 hours. Finally then, Graham Barquette gets into the car. Little work going on underneath the bonnet there. And the Kiwi is still running well at this stage. Down off the jacks comes the car for the final time. And back into the race. And behind it there is the Grice Commodore. While the 24-hour race continues, we've made several references to next year's 1987 Spa Classic being a round of the first ever World Touring Car Championship. It's been a long time coming. And the man responsible for so much of the planning is Ian Gamble of West Nally, Strathmore in New Zealand. Well, Ian, it must feel like uh, a, a nice period for you. At least it's going to get off the ground. Yes, it's, uh, it's definitely going to start next year. And uh, we're looking ahead to Monza with the first round. Tell me this, uh, when did you first conjure up the idea that the sport should have a World Touring Car title? Probably about two years ago now. Well, the, when the, we had the first race in Wellington in New Zealand, uh, everyone had talked about a World Championship for years, and uh, we just made a few inquiries, and uh, uh, it was just a matter of someone getting off their butt and, and doing something about it. That, uh, it's more than one person, of course. It's, oh, uh, obviously, but yeah. how difficult has it been to, to piece together? Because I would think, having dialogue with the people in Paris and FIA and FISA, I present one or two problems. Yeah, very frustrating. Uh, the hair's going and uh, getting greyer. But uh, everyone's trying to push their own barrow, and probably understandably, that, that, and that's from circuits to teams, upwards and downwards. So it's a matter of pulling all the strings together, and uh, we're finally getting there. So the series will start at Monza in Italy next March. Yes. And how many rounds? Well, 11 rounds. And the final round will be uh, in Fuji in Japan in November the 8th of 87. Well, for New Zealand and Australian viewers, there's good news with the James Hardy race and, of course, the Nissan Mobile That's 500 right. and Wellington being rounds. That's right. Yes, both are, both are round, rounds uh, 9 and 10. So the, the uh, Wellington race will follow on uh, three weeks after James Hardy. Well, congratulations. A lot of people have been talking about it for a number of years. Well, You've finally done it's it. It's up to everyone now, now to make it work. Another Kiwi strikes good. Uh, along with Australians. Ian Gamble, of course, one of the men responsible through West Nally Strathmore for your 1987 World Touring Car Championship. And the man leading Spa at the moment is the big bear himself, Denny Holm. Bastos Rover number seven there. Going away, he's not got a very big lead, though. Gerhard Berger's in second place. And there in the pits is the man that was leading, Tom Walkinshaw with Bastos Rover number eight. Yes, they've had a wretched run of luck uh, in the last 15 minutes. Axel out of the car. Some major problems for Tom Walkinshaw and Wynn Percy. They've had Axel problems uh, throughout the career, of, really, of the, uh, of the Rover. Tom doesn't seem too unhappy about the whole situation, but he knows now that he's not going to win Spa 1986. <laughs> In comes Bastos Rover number seven now, Holm bringing the car in. That will automatically put Gerhard Berger into the lead in car number 10. So a pretty sad uh, situation for the walking shore camp. Yes, that car's also coming in for brakes at this stage, which means the stop will be over three minutes, so he's a lap here, in fact. Well, Tom Walkinshaw led this race. Of course, during the early stages, pulled out a 56-second gap before Armin Hanna took over the lead. There's been some conjecture over two-way radios in cars. It was hinted that Tom Walkinshaw was using one. The official's pointing to the mast on top of his uh, PR unit. 
hopefully Tom will be explaining to them how he can make a regular contact with a cab company if anything else goes wrong with the team and he can get off to Spain and watch his sports cars race. So the number seven car has been refired and it will rejoin the Spa 24-hour Classic with six hours still to go. The Spa 24-hour Classic and BMW go together. Well, they certainly look like going together in 1986. Emmanuel Pirro in the number 10 car has taken over the lead. Rovers dropping out of the top four positions and Pirro at this stage is in pretty good shape. Schnitzer, of course, had a 1-2 for BMW here in this 24-hour Classic last year. And at this stage of the race, they're looking good for a repeat in 1986. Yes, two of the drivers that won last year, Gerhard Berger and Roberto Revelia driving that 10 car. Pirro at the wheel at the moment, on for his first ever win of the Spa 24-hour race. And there's the 11 car in second place. Should anything go wrong with the lead car, Thierry Tassa, who's now at the wheel of that, another Formula 3000 star, will take over. That car some six laps behind the 10 car at the moment, Mike. Well, we've seen so many things go wrong with the uh, cars overnight, and particularly during the early morning stages. Who knows who's going to win this race? But as you say, Piro looking good in the number 10 car, and the second of the Schnitzer cars running in second spot. There's Graham Bauquet, car number six. He is ninth on the road at the moment, so they've done very, very well indeed. The Kiwi's looking good in the second of the Mobile Commodores. Yes, Spa is all about reliability, and that's one thing that this car has got. There's still some five hours to go. It can move up still further yet. He goes past the stranded rover of Ron Dixon there, and as you say, he's in ninth place. Motor racing is a sport where being down doesn't necessarily always mean being out. Take, for example, the seat here from Alan Grice's Roadways Commodore. You'll see that the seat is, in fact, shattered. And that's a problem caused by Grice's co-driver, Belgian Michel Delcourt. The problem is Michel weighs about five times that of Alan Grice. And for some of the other fun of endurance racing, just look behind me. These are the crew members of the mobile dealer team who have been working throughout the night. Good fun, isn't it, endurance racing? And the reason they're doing it is because associated with the Spa 24-hour race is the traditional King's Cup. And that goes to the manufacturer who feels the biggest number of cars in the top position. Now, Rover cannot win. They started three, they have two running. Volvo started two, have one running. And the Eggenberger Ford started two with one running. But at the moment, there are three Commodores still running. Well, there were, but Neil Lowe is bringing this car in now, and this is not a scheduled pit stop. It comes in very slowly, and uh, the mechanics are quick to lift the bonnet. They've obviously got a problem with it. And the problem is no oil pressure. Lowe walks disconsolately away from the car, and they're going to push it back to see what they can do about the problem, see if uh, they can fix it. But this could be a problem now for the King's Cup for them. They need three Commodores running at the finish. So not insurmountable problems? No, no, no. Um, things that can be repaired in a 24-hour hour race, uh, obviously uh, it pays to repair and keep on going. and. Uh, finish somewhere. I mentioned earlier about the King's Cup. Explain that to the viewers. The King's Cup is a very prestigious cup. It's been awarded uh, since the, in the inception of the 24-hour race here at Spa. It's based on the uh, accumulated uh, laps of three nominated cars. And they, or, or the average of those three laps. And those, those three cars have been nominated before the race begins. At the moment, uh, three holds have started. Holdens will finish as we're speaking and uh, we're looking pretty good to win the King's Cup which in European eyes is second only to outright first. Well that's BMW number 10 Gerhard Berger with Atomic written on the side of his helmet and there's been some sort of atomic problem with that car Mike I think. Yes they were looking so good the car is in the pits now mechanics under the front of the car it was suggested that uh, in trying to cool it earlier they threw uh, a bucket of water over the alternator and have had problems since but mechanics have been working on the car here for about four or five minutes Berger steps from the car he wouldn't be very very happy at all about the whole situation that's Roberto Revelia there getting into it now these two of course won the race last year with the Schnitzer BMW Berger playing about with the front wheel I wonder if he's clipped a curb or something I think just nervous energy at the moment the realisation that the Spa 24 hour race is going away from the number 10 car. Looking for the 11 car as well. So the good car.
comes up on the number 10 Schnitzer BMW. It's dropped out of the lead. It's up quite a lot of time. And while it sits in the pits there, they're waiting for car number 11. Here it comes. The Dequestra at the wheel at the moment, and this car is the one that's going to take over the lead now. Dequestra gets out. Thierry Tassau, the Belgian, gets in. That's going to be popular with the home crowd. He won the race in 1983. He's finished twice apart from that in second place. Tassau gets into it. That's Charlie Lamb, you can see at the front of the car there, directing operations, and they're still trying to cool the number 10 car. I think they'll need more than the air gun to cool it down if, uh, if they've got major overheating problems. There's been smoke and steam. Uh, Tassar jumps into the car and he resumes and keeps the lead. That's Johnny Chicotto there talking to his wife who's doing the timekeeping for the Volvo team. And there is the Chicotto car coming up behind the very slow Armin Hana rover, the number seven rover there, going very slowly indeed. And Chicotto's car's got a damaged windscreen there, Mike. Yes, looks like uh, it's picked up a rock across the windscreen. All they did at the last pit stop was put some 100 mile an hour tape over the front of it. It wouldn't be a very, very pleasant car to drive under those circumstances with the windscreen cracked. However, it continues. It's one of uh, the two Volvos that were entered in the race. 14 there, that's Carlo Rossi and the Michangeli brothers. It's a privately entered car from Italy. And would you believe that car's now in second place? Well, they've done very well. Mind you, the attrition rate has helped them just a little bit, but it's good to see a privateer doing so well in the late stages of this race. And time is certainly running out at the Spa 24 hours. BMW is still looking good. The one manufacturer not looking so good is Volvo. Would you believe the number two car in the last hour of the race, Thomas Lindstrom took it out and crashed it. Lindstrom would have been able to take that second place off the 14 car. One car that's well in the lead of its class there is 44. 325 BMW in the hands of Grand Prix star Christian Danner and Winnie Voigt, its regular driver. It's in about fifth place overall, would you believe? The car has been a strong performer in the European Touring Car Championship this year, the 325, driven by Winnie Voigt. Its main competitor has been the 190 16 valve Mercedes. Those have all dropped out, and here are the Commodores again. Yes, Alan Moffat in car number five, and Alan Grice in number 27. They're running in pretty close company in the closing stages of this race. Keeping in mind, though, in order for Australians to take the King's Cup, it will require the number six mobile Commodore to come back out on the racetrack. And it has diabolical problems with no oil pressure whatsoever. So Moffat sweeps through, followed by Alan Grice. Two Commodores still running, and looky here. Number six has been fired up for one and a half laps around the circuit. So maybe Neil has the real lowdown on the King's Cup at Spa in 1986. Three Aussie V8s are back on the track, and the right track at that. So then, down towards our rooms for the last few minutes of the race, goes car number 11, Thierry Tassin, the Belgian at the wheel. His teammates, Dieter Cuesta and Alfred Hagar, sitting in the pits waiting, just praying that that car will make the last few laps around the spa Francochon circuit. Here's Denny Holm, the big bear in uh, the Bastos Rover. The car has been just limping around, almost like Neil Lowe for the last couple of laps. All Denny wants to do is get to the line. 635 BMW is holding down the first four positions, and that's the one in fourth. It's the more veteran, Rennie Metch. Car number 23, the Bavaria Automobiles car, comes through, and that's just what you get for a smooth, reliable run here at Spa, fourth place. Well, Spa is really about consistency. Sprinting, of course, looks good for the fans in the early part of the race, but being there at the finish is what it's all about. There's Alan Moffat in car number five. Moffat, of course, has made a valuable contribution to the mobile team. So, too, has John Harvey during the day segment of this race. Peter Brock did a stint during the evening. The car went off the course. They had a little work to do. And here's Neil Lowe in car number six, still limping around the circuit. Has no oil pressure whatsoever. I tell you what, if he finds a little uphill section, he might be in for a spot of bother. But Lowe continues trying to get to the line. Just staying off the course, not through the fast part of the, uh, the racetrack, of course, to give everyone else a fair go behind him. But Lowe is limping around, trying to make the finish and put a little polish on that King's Cup. Meantime, Alan Moffat in car number five, and of course, Alan Grice in 27. They're running bumper to bumper in the final lap of this race. And I'll tell you what, if, uh, if Neil Lowe can manage to just get around and park perhaps even at the top out of La Source and sit there, and here he comes now. Car number six, Neil Lowe, almost in angel gear, coming up to this tight right-hander. 
we'll see if he pulls it across because it's a downhill run here to the finish as you can see yes and he's going to sit there and wait until the uh, leader goes across takes the checkered flag and then uh, just drop it out of gear Moffat will look for him as they come through the turn knows he's sitting there Grice now does too so all it requires is low just to drop the clutch in and uh, let it go all the way down to the flag now, Siggy Muller in the Ford Sierra, a remarkable performance that this car never has done a 24 hour race before and it's still running at the finish. It's had innumerable problems including replacing a turbocharger. They've had a great run during the European Touring Car Championship as well. We've got about maybe one lap to go, time is running out. Tassar in the number 11 BMW, the Schnitzer entry, goes across the line and Tassar, along with Dieter Cuesta, is going to pick up the Sparrow 24 hour classic for 1986. Yes, onto the far side of the circuit now, running one to the BMWs. Even more than that, Rossi and the Meek and Jelly Brothers running in second spot, Roberto Revalia in third, Metch in fourth, Christian Danner in the 325 in fifth spot, and Denny Holm in sixth. Coming up to the last corner, La Source, the number 10 car out of the racetrack for the effect of coming down to the chequered flag, and Tassar. Not too much to go now. He's going to take the 24-hour classic here at Spa Francorchamps. The flags are out. The 24-hour classic is over. And it goes to BMW with Tessa and Dieter Cuesta, the winners. Yes, you can see Cuesta jumping up and down there by the side of the track as Tessa goes through. First to fifth positions there for the BMWs. And here come the Commodores. Alan Moffat on the inside separated here by uh, Siggy Muller but they'll try and close up and let Deal Low now sprint there's Low off to the right they form it up and here they come and getting a marvellous reception from this huge crowd at Spa Francorchamps the King's Cup trophy is definitely going to go to the Aussies they go across the line and the Aussies have managed one thing that other 20 cars have failed to do they've all finished they might all be outside of the top 15 but they have won the King's Cup and there's the presentation for the winners Thierry Tassa Dieter Cuesta and Alfred Hagar. And there on the presentation podium, Alan Grice, Alan Moffitt with the champagne. Michel Delcourt standing alongside and John Harvey, Peter Brock, the whole team up there. Moffitt gets presented with the cup and holds it aloft to the applause. Well, BMW might have won the fight here at Spa, but the war of endurance has been won by the Aussie Commodore. Not only the mobile Holden dealer team, but also Alan Grice and the Roadways Commodore. And we've got a very, very happy crew here because they've all won the King's Cup. And congratulations. Alan, a pretty tough race for you? Oh, it was tough for the drivers, but uh, 24 hours is a mechanics race, I think. Um, the drivers really, I think their job is to not bang the car and it's the mechanics to keep them going. It's a mechanics race, I think. And every, uh, every member of, e of each of the crews uh, did an excellent job. We had everything between us. We had everything that's possible to go wrong. And uh, they got them running again. Michel Delcourt, who led the Belgian Congo line in this one. Some problems with the seat, but you were able to overcome that. Yes, the seat is a little bit too small for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, not strong enough. Uh, Michelle Delcourt has got a sense of humour. Neil Lowe, congratulations to you. Of course, you were up running pretty strongly in the uh, wee small hours of this morning that things went a little wrong late in the day. Yes, we had an hour to go and we were in eighth place. But these things happen. Uh, we just had a small mechanical malfunction that really sidelined us for an hour. Never mind, we got there for the last lap and we finished. Congratulations also to John Harvey, who did more driving than I'm probably going to season in Australia. <laughs> Well, I really do know the, the, the meaning of the word gruelling now. That was the most gruelling event I've ever been in. <laughs> At Alan Moffat, no stranger to 24-hour races, a tough one? It was. It, it, it's a tough course. You've got to stay with it all the time. And uh, as Alan Grice said, the fellows that stayed with it here were our Holden team, and uh, they just wouldn't let the car stop. And uh, John and I and Peter had to keep going. Well, a good win, of course, for Holden Commodore. And we've got a bunch of Australians here. I'll remind you, gentlemen, it's only a few weeks to go to James Hardy 1000. But that'll seem a breeze after 24 hours. This motorsport feature was proudly presented by your mobile team and Holden, Australia's driving future.